All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, over the past probably two years, I've uh, given a lot of presentations on this subject, uh, protecting young trees. And just because of the importance of, of young trees and the future of our industry, I mean, this has been a hot topic. And of course, um, you know, probably something we need to be discussing and keeping, keeping on top of in terms of our psyllid management programs, particularly in terms of young trees. Um, again, because I've talked about this so many times, I know a lot of this is going to be reviewed. There's not a whole lot of new information today, but I have tried to put some new, as much new information as I've got available right now into this presentation, so it won't be totally all old information, but again, hopefully if, if you've heard most of this before, at least hopefully it'll be a good review for you. Um, when we talk about uh, young tree, uh, soil control programs for young trees, uh, the foundation of those programs are going to be the use of soil applied neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, things such as Admire, uh, the imidacloprid that everybody's familiar with, we've had the longest, um, platinum or thymethoxam, and also more recently Belay um, uh, clothianidin. And all three of those are neonicotinoids that can be applied as a soil drench application. Uh, to young trees in the field. Again, those are they're applied to the soil, they're taken up by the root system, moved through the xylem, and then distributed throughout the leaf canopy um, of the tree where they control psyllids and also leaf miner and some other pest. Now the reason these are such an important part of our young tree programs has to do not only with the, the extended period of duration of control of these insects they provide, but they, this, at least in terms of the soil applied neonicotinoids, they also disrupt psyllid feeding behavior, especially those, those behaviors responsible for transmission of the HLB pathogen. Uh, or in other words, inoculation where a psyllid pumps that HLB bacterium into a healthy plant uh, causing an infection. And I, I think everybody's probably seen some of the presentations we've given in the past talking about the work that we've been doing uh, where we actually wire up the psyllids and uh, we're actually able to connect that to a computer and we get different waveforms that are produced so we can actually tell what the psyllids are doing in the plant, where they're feeding and what's taking place. And what we're most interesting, interested in doing is actually disrupting these, these behaviors that are, respond, are related to phloem feeding behaviors. Phloem salivation, which is the point where the psyllid puts the bacteria back into the plant in, inoculates a healthy plant, and also the phloem ingestion. This is where the psyllids actually go to feed on an infected plant and acquire or pick up the bacteria and can then move it to other plants. So what we want to be able to do is prevent these behaviors from occurring, especially in terms of young trees, because again, we want to, if we're going to put a lot of money and investment into young trees, we want to make sure that we get those in the field and that they're able to uh, get up to bearing age with, that, with at least as few as possible becoming infected with the HLB bacterium. So the, the pie charts down here at the bottom just kind of give you an idea of what's happening with the psyllid feeding behavior. This is an untreated um, citrus plant, psyllid feeding behaviors. It's probably hard to read. Um, those are the phloem behaviors right there. But then you look at a psyllid feeding on an, an imidacloprid treated uh, tree, for example, right here. Uh, basically, they do some initial probing, just putting their mouth parts into the plant. And then they spend the rest of the time, this orange is actually pretty much they're dead or they're jumping off the plant. Uh, you can see all these numbers up here are 0%. They just spend little or no time actually in, in the phloem on those imidacloprid treated plants. And so this is the same thing. This is, really holds true for all three of the neonicotinoids uh, when they're applied as a soil drench application. Uh, imidacloprid, thymethoxam, and clothianidin all disrupted those phloem feeding behaviors for at least six weeks. And I say at least six weeks. We've not gone further at this point in some of the, the timing studies uh, because really uh, under field conditions, um, we're going to see variations in the concentration of these products in the leaf tissue um, and that's going to affect the duration of control or feeding disruption. And these, these concentrations in the leaf tissue are going to be dependent on the rate of material applied per tree and also tree size. And there could be other things going on in the field, you know, whether it's rainfall or the amount of new flush that, that the product's getting diluted through that can affect the duration of control. But we feel pretty confident in saying that we're going to get at least six weeks of uh, feeding disruption out of these products. Um, and so we currently have some more in-depth studies underway where we're looking to determine how long that true protection really lasts with these soil applied products based on the amount applied uh, given a certain tree size. So we're going out, we're, we're applying these products at different rates to different sizes of trees. Then we're measuring the concentrations of, of these products, imidacloprid and others, in the leaf tissue uh, to then determine how long, once we figure out that magic number, how long can we maintain a certain level in that tree and keep it protected. Uh, from psyllid feeding behavior. So that's some stuff that's going on right now underway. So another question I get is how much protection should we really expect out of these products? And I'll, I'll start by saying that even you know, on the best program uh, with these soil applied neonics under field conditions, they're not going to provide 100% protection from HLB. Um, nothing's perfect. 
Uh, generally what we're seeing in the field, and I've got some data I'll show towards the end, I think you can probably expect anywhere from less than 1% to as much as maybe 3% of uh, annual infection rate uh, in the field uh, where you've got a program in place. Um, generally, we've seen you know, less than 1% in some of the work we've been doing. But again, there's a lot of factors that can affect uh, how well this is going to work. One has to do with the distribution of the product within the plant. Um, and this one thing, at one point I just wanted to make that I've seen a lot uh, happening firsthand uh, this year when I've been out working, uh, it has to do with the, the accuracy of the application that's being applied. And I'll just show this as an example. This is actually out at our farm, but uh, I think it makes the point that uh, as you're driving along, if, if you've got a quarter mile stretch of trees or something, you're running, the guy's got the gas pedal pretty pushed down pretty hard, running and squirting those trees on the go. You can see, it's hard to tell here, but the, the application's actually starting out here. And he actually, I didn't have the shot, but he almost went out to the, to the, uh, ir the microjet when he did that drench, he was going so fast. You know, you have to slow down and get all that material right there at that base of that tree, or you're losing some of your material out here where the root system's not present. So that's just something to think about. If you see your guys flying through the grove a little too fast, you may want to say slow down and try to get as much of that material on the root system of the tree as possible because, again, the amount of product taken up by the tree is going to affect how long it's going to last and provide you that protection. Um, also, some other factors that are going to affect the success of these programs uh, have to do with uh, the sealed population pressure the trees are being exposed to, not only in the, in the young tree block of interest, but also the surrounding areas. Um, in general, the lower the sealed population is, the greater your success is going to be in keeping that HLB spread low through the, through the young tree block. And that's, that's really common sense when you think about it. But we're really talking about a numbers game here because, again, you know, the idea that the CHIMA program we'll hear about later on today um, you know, the area-wide programs keeping psyllid populations low. The fewer psyllids that are coming in and encountering those, those treated blocks of, uh, of young trees, the less likely you're going to have survivors that can actually come in and feed and, and uh, spread the pathogen. So again, it's, it's really a numbers game. And uh, it also emphasizes the importance that not only um, are we relying on these soil applied applications for our young tree programs, but foliar sprays are also going to be an important component uh, to work into the young tree program both in the young block and the surrounding areas. Uh, the importance of the foliar sprays, again, you know, is keeping psyllid pressure as low as possible, but it's also going to be important, I'll show an example in a little bit, uh, for reducing the chances of uh, pesticide resistance from developing uh, in the field. Because again, we're talking about using uh, multiple soil applied neonicotinoids every six weeks. I'll show that schedule here in a little bit. And if you keep on doing that repeatedly, we have a chance of losing the effectiveness of those neonicotinoids because we're using that same mode of action over and over. So it's really important to rotate uh, pesticide modes of action, and that's what these foliar insecticide applications, one of the other benefits provided by these applications. Again, so that we can maintain the effectiveness of the soil applied neonicotinoids. There are some limitations on the foliar sprays. Um, they generally, uh, compared to these soil applied systemics, have a much shorter residual effect. Um, in terms of both uh, uh, their effects on psyllid feeding and disruption or preventing pathogen transmission from occurring, um, but also the duration of, of psyllid control in general, the, the, just the mortality, the overall killing of psyllids uh, is much shorter with the foliar sprays compared to the soil applied systemics. Um, and so I'll just show a couple examples here. In terms of the uh, uh, feeding disruption, if you compare this to the uh, soil applied systemics where we're getting at least three, six weeks of, of dis feeding disruption, with the foliar products here, we're ranging anywhere from as much as three weeks down to, you know, 24 hours or, or no feeding disruption. And so there's a lot of variability, but the thing I wanted to point out, it doesn't mean these products down here aren't valuable. These are all valuable products uh, in the grand scheme of our management programs. But these aren't going to provide that feeding disruption on young trees that we're going to get out of the soil applied products. So again, the primary benefit of, of some of these foliar applications is going to be keeping the psyllid population in general overall low and also helping to maintain or prevent pesticide resistance to the neonicotinoids on these young trees. We've also done some work, uh, this is actually some work done by my master's student, Christine Weaver, uh, who's been looking at the, uh, the actual true residual control provided by foliar insecticides. Um, how long do they really control psyllid populations? And you'll hear a lot of us talk about trial work we do where we, we uh, go out and spray different pesticides and we look at how long do we keep psyllid populations below or less than the, the untreated controls. Well, really what we're measuring there is once we've wiped out the psyllid population, how long does it take for psyllids to come back in and reinfest that area? And that can depend on how good of a job you are or are not doing around that block. So what she did here, she's able to go out and she was caging psyllids on trees 
that had been treated uh, with, uh, we had three different insecticides being tested, and unfortunately you can't read these bars up here. But the blue bar is imidacloprid, I believe. The red bar is dimethylate, and the green bar would be uh, fenpropathrin or danitol. And so just comparing these insecticide applications, and also not only at, at 1, 8, um, 15, and 22 days after application, but also at different times of the year. So we wanted to see how long do these, res these true residual effects last, and are there differences at different times of the year. So um, I kind of went through that fast, so I'll explain what she did basically, is that one day after application, she caged psyllids, left them for a week, came back and assessed mortality. How many were dead? Were we still, did we kill a lot of psyllids at one day? Then at eight days, she did another caging. Then again, I think 15 or 16 days here, and then at 20-something days. Um, so what the results showed here, um, it's going to be hard to see from this, but I uh, apologize for that. But you can see here that one day after application, all the products were generally, uh, in general, were uh, providing about 100% control uh, one day after application. Uh, one exception is here. This is in September. We had a high rainfall event. Uh, later that evening after the, apl the applications were done in the morning and then by about four or five in the afternoon we had a rainfall event and that actually reduced the efficacy. We only killed about uh, 60 percent of the psyllids uh, one day after application just because of the rainfall event. And we still, the products were allowed to dry and you know everything seemed to be good but just that rainfall event had an effect. But you can see here uh, in this particular in January here we can see uh, eight days after application uh, there's no significant difference between these treatments here, um, but they're ranging from, you know, 40 to 60 percent control, um, you know, eight days after application. And then you get out here, you know, two weeks and three weeks out, and you're getting less than 20 percent control. Uh, the same thing is really kind of holding true uh, throughout the season. In April, you know, we're only getting about 50 percent control uh, a week after the application. Here in September, we had that high rainfall event. We just didn't get good, good control at all. And so it's not necessarily that it was the product failure, but we're seeing the effects of weather and the conditions on how long these products actually lasted. Again, in November, uh, again, eight days were not looking so good. Uh, there was some rainfall events before here as well. They weren't quite as high as September. And then January is the same story. But the take home here is that a lot of these products, in terms of actual killing power, don't last that long. The residual effects aren't as long as we might think they are. And um, the other thing to point out is that we didn't see any difference in terms of the efficacy of products, say, pyrethroids versus organophosphates, summer versus wintertime. Now, there's been a misconception out there that, well, pyrethroids don't work in the summer and organophosphates don't work in the winter. And what these data show, there's no difference between organophosphates and pyrethroids uh, at different times of the year throughout this study. And so a lot of that has to do with, you know, some of the work that that was based on had, was laboratory studies using very low rates of insecticides. But using the high rates we use in the field, uh, we can't distinguish any difference relative efficacy between an organophosphate and a pyrethroid at different times of the year. So I think that's important to point out. So just the results that she's shown here is that the actual residual control of, of populations can be very short with these fuller insecticide applications. And uh, the, probably the predominant effect that we've been able to tease out is the effect of rainfall having the most impact on how long an insecticide application is going to last. So especially when we get into the rainy season, the products, these foliar sprays, aren't going to last quite as long as they would at other times of the year. And again, the comparative effectiveness of products really doesn't change at different times of the year, uh, at least under true field conditions that we're used to applying these products. Uh, so for the example with uh, pyrethroids versus organophosphates, we just don't see anything that would suggest that a pyrethroid true or an organophosphate is truly going to work better than a pyrethroid in the middle of the summer or vice versa. So uh, that's really not holding true under field conditions. So with that in mind, when you're thinking about product choice when you're going to apply products, really that product choice should be based on the need uh, to rotate modes of action between your sprays. Um, there may be other things that dictate product choice. If you're uh, harvesting, obviously you want something with a, with a low uh, uh, PHI and REI. Uh, but other than that, you want to really make sure that you're rotating modes of action. And so there's no need to just go pyrethroid, pyrethroid, pyrethroid during the winter months with the idea that an OP is not going to work, or, the, or vice versa with a pyrethroid, or using only OPs in the summertime because a pyrethroid wouldn't work then. That's, that's really not the case. And so again, it's just important to make sure that you're rotating the modes of action uh, throughout the year. Now I'll change gears just a little bit because uh, again, this is uh, mainly I'm, I'm trying to focus here on the young tree programs. And something else that we're looking at on young trees right now is uh, kale and clay or the Surround WP. You can see here this is the product that's been around for quite a while. 
Uh, this is a clay-based aluminosilicate mineral. It uh, leaves a white residue uh, on, the, on the surface of the treated plant leaves. And um, there's been a lot of work in the past, uh, particularly from the USDA, that's shown that the, this actually deters uh, insect uh, feeding and infestations. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. But here's just a shot showing a, a tree uh, treated with kaolin and that white, that white residue on the leaf surface. You can see some there on the grass below it. And um, again, there's been some work done. Some of the earliest work in citrus was done uh, by, the, by the USDA group over in Fort Pierce, and McKinsey and LaPointe, uh, Wayne Hunter and some others. And they showed that surround applications reduced psyllid nymphs uh, by 31% and adult psyllid populations by 61% over a two-week period. And I think that what happened is after about a two-week period, this is done in the, in the rainy season, uh, the effectiveness wore off just because of rainfall. And this is not very rain fast. And that's, that's kind of the results from another study from USDA, from David Hall and LaPointe and others, that showed that surround applications inhibited the ability of the psyllids to grasp, move, and uh, lay eggs on treated plants. And again, that the effects were degraded by rain. And so it's a rain fast issue of when it can and cannot be used. Um, but again, it's actually interfering with the ability of the psyllids to actually move around on the plants. And we've actually found the same thing in some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, this is some work being done by one of my PhD students, uh, where they've actually, what you're looking at here, these pictures are actually the tarsal claws, the feet of psyllids. So here's a, the foot of a psyllid that's clean, and that's what they use to grab a hold of the leaf surface and hold on really tight. And once they've got a good hold on that plant, they can actually insert their mouth parts in and start feeding. When they get the kaolin, the kaolin actually gums up their feet. It's like walking in, you know, in, in mud or maybe uh, walking on ice. So basically, they can't grab hold of the plant surface. And you can actually take that leaf, turn it upside down, and the psyllids fall off. They can't hold on. And so what he found is we actually did some more of those, the wiring up of the psyllids, looking at psyllid feeding behavior on untreated leaves. You can see this is the general 24-hour constant feeding behavior is going on here by psyllids. But you put psyllids on a, a, a kaolin-treated surface, they do some initial, these are actually some walking uh, spikes and a few initial probes, but then it just kind of flatlines. They quit feeding because they can't get those, their mouth parts into the plant surface. And it mainly has to do with the ability of them to hold onto the plant, to grab hold and be able to get that leverage to put their mouth parts into the plant. I think it would kind of be like getting on a frozen lake. This is probably a good example for Florida, but getting on a frozen lake and trying to take a shovel and you know, dig a hole in the ice, you just can't get, that, you can't get traction or hold yourself steady to dig down in. It's the same case with these psyllids. And so that's kind of how this kaolin is actually working uh, in terms of disrupting psyllid feeding on, on plants. Now, we'll mention just some potential problems with kaolin. And the first that's been uh, you know, found over and over in the history of kaolin use but here in Florida is that it can actually create some other pest problems. Um, and scale insects are the primary thing that comes to mind. Uh, and what happens is that the, 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 the clay or this dust on the plant actually uh, interferes with the parasitoids that keep scale insects in check. It clogs their antennae, and so they can't actually find the scale insects. So um, it can actually cause an increase in scale insect popula populations. In the work we've been doing over the past two years on young trees, we've not seen that happen primarily because we are going in with neonicotinoid insecticides as soil applications that are probably keeping those scale populations from reaching uh, high levels. So when you're on young trees, when you're combining this with a soil applied neonics, I think we're negating that, that scale problem. We're keeping that from happening. Um, I don't know if the, how relevant this is, but you know, you put the, the kaolin out there on the leaf surface, you're masking the HLB symptoms, at least those blotchy models, if you were trying to scout for and figure out how much infection you have out there. So I don't know, I mean, obviously there's less tree removal going on than there has been in the past, but that would be one thing that could happen. And I've also got a lot of questions about the shading effects on, of, on the coated leaves. And um, uh, I've talked to Jim Syvertson at the CREC. Um, he's done a lot of work on kaolin effects on the, plant, on the tree, citrus tree physiology, uh, looking at what effects it might actually have on the ability of plants to photosynthesize. And just talking to him yesterday, one of the comments he made was that uh, if you're using it on mature trees, uh, if you're getting it back on the interior leaves deep inside the canopy, it's possible you might have an effect on those leaves where they're getting very little sunlight to start with. You might actually have an effect there. But he felt pretty positive that this probably is not going to be a problem on young trees where all the leaves are uh, greatly sun exposed. And he's actually done, so, they've actually published some papers. Here's one of them which talks about uh, part kaolin uh, can actually increase the photosynthesis and water use efficiency of ruby red grapefruit. And to sum up this paper, what they did, they found was that um, kaolin actually had beneficial effects on photosynthesis during the middle of the summer. And what happens in general, I'm going to try to summarize this as an entomologist, I'm not a plant person, but once you get somewhere above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 
the plants tend to shut down. It's too hot, photosynthesis doesn't occur. So the plants kind of quit growing once it gets too hot. But what they found was that the, the kaolin on the, leaf, on the leaf surface actually kept the plants growing. It kept the leaf temperature cooler, so you actually got more growing hours throughout the day, uh, especially in excessive heat conditions during the summer. And so it, it actually could be a beneficial effect uh, on, on these young trees, helping to increase uh, tree growth. And I'll show you this one example here. This came out of the group out of Fort Pierce uh, when they were doing some work uh, back in early 2000. Uh, looking at, I think it was diapreppies, might have been the trial they were doing. They were going out in the summer every two weeks applying kaolin. And as I've been told, uh, these trees are all the same age, and these were getting kaolin at a high rate every two weeks, whereas these were not. And you can see the difference in growth. I'm not suggesting you're going to get that based on what we're recommending you do, because uh, again, they were doing this in the summer every two weeks. It would probably be unrealistic commercially for us to do that. But the point I'm trying to make is that kaolin was not impeding plant growth. Was the, that's the main point I want to uh, make here today about that. So the current studies that we have with kaolin, uh, we're, we are showing a, an effective reduction in psyllid infestations. Uh, these, these, the kaolin applications are deterring psyllids from feeding on, on these kaolin-treated trees. And just because I know I'll get questions about this, the application rates that are being tested in the field uh, we're using, in our initial applications on the plant, we're doing 50 pounds of the product in a 100 gallons of water spray volume. So that's the concentration we're using. And that's kind of serving as an initial primer or base coater, coat, if, like if you think about painting a wall, trying to get that, that primer on there. And then as we come back with follow-up sprays on a monthly basis, we're coming in at 10 to 20 pounds per 100 gallons of water just to try to maintain that coating or the coverage, thorough coverage of the kaolin on the leaf surface. And that seems to be working very well so far in the, in the studies that we're doing. Um, what I will say is the residual effects, I think this is the, kind of the real point I wanted to get to on the kaolin, what we're finding is that the residual effects of kaolin are actually longer than conventional foliar insecticides, except where you have the loss of residues due to rainfall, and also where you have new leaf growth that's coming out that's, you know, that's not protected or not coated. So as the trees are flushing, you've got new leaves that aren't protected. But aside from that, as long as you keep that product on the leaf surface and keep it from getting washed off, it's providing an effective deterrent uh, against psyllid populations. Not 100%, but it does a very good job in uh, uh, keeping psyllid populations uh, greatly reduced on these treated plants. And so what we're doing right now is we're actually looking at uh, trying to develop a rainfall-based model for kaolin, kind of similar to what the copper model is in citrus, where we can look at rainfall and the amount applied or on a concentration basis and determine how often we need to actually reapply. And that's based on some work we're looking at, what concentrations needed to actually deter psyllid feeding. So that's some stuff that's ongoing right now in the lab. So I'm going to wrap up here real quickly uh, and just summarize a couple of data slides from an ongoing multi-year study that's looking at, can we take all this information that I've talked about today and apply it in the field to protect young tree plantings from HLB? And I think a lot of you have seen this information before. This is a study that's going on up at the Conserve 2 uh, research site up, uh, up around Orlando. A 10-acre block of Valencia orange that was planted in May of 2011. Uh, the treatments we're evaluating, uh, there are six different treatments. They're applied to uh, 10 replicate blocks of 20 trees each. Uh, we're going in with systemic, the soil applies systemic insecticides every six weeks. Treatment two would be the foliar applications monthly. The combination of, of soil applied systemics every six weeks plus foliar applications monthly. Kale and clay by itself monthly. Uh, the soil applied systemics every six weeks plus kale and monthly and an untreated control. We're just trying to compare these different program approaches to see what really works best in terms of preventing trees from becoming HLB infected. And we're actually going in every three months and running PCR on every single tree in that block to uh, determine if they're actually infected or not. Because we can't do base this on symptoms because tree symptoms are early on in a young tree aren't very prominent. So this is the results one year after planting, and I'll have, to, I'll have to specify one thing here in a minute, but you can see in our untreated controls we had after 12 months, 3.8% infection rate. Kaolin only was 1.3%. The monthly sprays of foliar insecticides, 2.5%. Soil drench only, 11.3%. That was the highest one. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But if you look down here, the soil applications plus kaolin, were, none of them were infected as were the soil plus foliar insecticides, 0% infection rate. Now what happened uh, here in this particular study, if you've, you've heard me talk about this before, we actually had, uh, after one year of going every six weeks with soil applied neonics and nothing else in certain plots, 
we actually had the psyllids become resistant to those products, and we actually had a control failure. And so that actually resulted in an increased, basically a lack of control and an increased rate of infection here. But the main point is, if you do the, the, the proper product rotation with the soil applied insecticides and either kaolin or the foliar, 12 months out, we were still 0% infected. And so that, that's actually good news right there from that standpoint. So that would basically be taking a program like this where you go every six weeks with either this is platinum and mire or belay every six weeks, and then between those applications, the orange bars would represent a foliar application, whether it's an insecticide or perhaps a kaolin application. If it's going to be kaolin, you don't want to be wasting your money probably putting it out in the middle of summer in the rainy season where it's not going to last very long. But what we're having most success with right now is coming in October, November, and using it you know, through about April, about this time of year, and it seems to be lasting for quite a long time. So those are the results uh, one year after planting. Um, now, as I mentioned, we had resistance build up uh, in the psyllid population to the neonicotinoids. And you can see here, this is what happened in, the, in, in some of those plots. About 12 months after uh, planting, we saw the psyllid population start to increase. And these are actually on uh, tap samples of psyllids, approaching four psyllids per tap per tree. And so that's actually pretty high populations that were building up in this young tree block. And as those populations went up over time, we started to see the HLB infection rate go up. And once we finally got the psyllids under control, we came in with a pyrethroid, cleaned the whole block out, and started over. We were already up to about, on average, 40% HLB infection just in this time period where we lost control of the psyllid population. So over a three or four month period, or actually less than that, of, of true failure, uh, we had a tremendous amount of HLB spread in that block, and that's what's shown here in this last slide. Um, I don't think this is, this is not what we're in for. This is not reason to get, you know, very concerned. It just shows, unless you're not doing a good job controlling psyllids. But what this does show is that if you let psyllids go uncontrolled, um, it doesn't take just a couple of months to get numbers like this that can build up in a young tree block. So it can happen very rapidly. And again, you can see here we just lost control across all treatments. You know, again, here the kaolin only looked the best, but during the summer months, the control wasn't that great because once we applied, it got washed off due to rainfall. So I think the results so far after 18 months in this trial, uh, the rotation of soil applied neonics plus foliar applications of insecticides or kaolin uh, have greatly been able to reduce those HLB infection rates. Keep those, especially if you looked at those data we had from one, you know, 12 months out, we were down, we were zero percent infection. Um, and so that was, that was a really good situation. It proved the, the point that we can do it, um, but it also, the data also show that uh, control failure, no matter, how, you know, a short control failure, can result in significant HLB spread throughout a young tree block. So I think those, the data that last slide I showed really kind of emphasized the importance of, you know, that if you're going to protect young trees from HLB, you have to be proactive. You have to, you know, really go after it and be aggressive in managing psyllids on young trees. And so I think a situation like this, where we're talking about going every six weeks with soil applied neonicotinoids, and as frequently as possible trying to break, it, break up those neonics with different modes of action on those young excuse me, on those young trees, is the approach that we need to, to be most successful in managing HLB spread in these young tree blocks. I know it's an expensive program. Um, you, you start doing the math and calculating how much it's going to cost to do that. It's expensive. But, you know, we're looking at the future of our industry, you know, getting young trees up into production. And if you're going to spend the money to pr put those trees in the ground, you need to be prepared to spend that money to protect those trees and make sure you get those up to bearing age with as few infections as possible. Um, of course, the big gap we have right now are these five to nine foot tall trees. You kind of max out on the use rate. We can only do two admire applications, one platinum right now. So then we're really relying on those foliar applications. Uh, if you space these out early, you know, in the middle part of the year here, it may be possible to come in something, even, even something like a kaolin application during the dormant season and try to uh, uh, keep psyllids off those trees as much as possible. And that's actually a, a project we have going right now, looking at kaolin as dormant applications uh, in Florida Citrus. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Mid-Florida Citrus Foundation for the, for the uh, help they've done in our young tree work, and also the CRDF for funding support, and also the members of my lab who are all involved in these projects. And again, I thank you for your support and your attention this morning.